We're building up godly men for a better tomorrow. This is On the Edge with Ken Harrison, where we inspire men of integrity to put faith into action together. Just before we get into today's episode, we'd like to invite you to subscribe to our weekly devotional group. Just text the two words, Promise Keepers, to 31996. Every week you'll receive a challenging devotional that will inspire you to put your faith into action in the real world. Again, text Promise Keepers to 31996. And now, here's today's show. Hey, you guys, join me for an amazing podcast with John Bevere. I'm not sure if I've ever had a discussion that was as important as the one I had with him. I was just enthralled as he described the fear of the Lord and told stories about the fear of the Lord, not being afraid of God, but fear of the Lord is in deep respect, like you'd respect a really good father, how you would fear being out of relationship with him, fear not abiding with him more than you would fear anything else. So that you would rather give up everything you have to not disappoint the Lord because you respect and know him that much. He is the great almighty God. He is the God that created 100 billion trillion planets, as uh, Hugh Ross says. So join me in this talk because I, I don't think I've ever been so challenged, so fascinated in a conversation as I was with my good friend, John Bevere. He knows the subject like uh, nobody that I've ever talked to. Join us. John Bevere, you and I become like best friends. It's like one of those. We, it's amazing. The Holy Spirit, like just boom. The second we had dinner together, it went on for five no, no, hours. no. It was before that. It was the phone call. The phone call. Right? I'm on the phone with you, and I, you know, you were like really casual with me. I was casual with you, and all of a sudden, it was like the Holy Spirit literally came in the phone call, and I'm like, whoa, this is a man of God I'm talking to, and I, I don't say that flippantly. I, I, I say that very sincerely. And I called my son right afterwards because my son had already become friends with you. And I said, I have to get to know this man better. And so that's that that's where it really began. And then we had the big dinner, which then I'm sure you were going each other, which made it way stronger. Right. 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 Men. If but you came over now. for a simple dinner and it was five hours. So we're going to take. So we talked about fear of the Lord for five hours. Yeah, we did. And so now we're going to try to boil that down into one hour. Yeah, we'll, we'll <laughs> attempt. We'll, we'll try. Yeah, because so. it's not boring. I mean, no. all you guys that are listening, I'm just really excited. I can't even wait to see what the Holy Spirit does. So why don't we do this? Because I was searching for at that moment. I was praying and fasting. Lord, why are you bringing Promise Keepers back? I mean, it's not to get a bunch of guys together in a stadium. What's the reason? And, and as I was praying and fasting, I told you I, the day that we got together for dinner, I read the passage on Aaron's two sons, priests. Mm -hmm. They, they learn how they, be, they become officially priests. Then they go and they kind of make fire in a pan. We're not really sure what that means, but it was flippant. It was common. It was probably showing off. Look at who we are. And God strikes them both dead. He burns them both alive. Right. Because they treated the things of the Lord as common. And that was what, I mean, like a weird passage to read before we get together. Then you tell the story about Jim Baker. Can you tell that story? Is it okay? Yeah, to sure. And then, and let's go from there. Well, from, you know, let's let's get back to Aaron. I mean, all four of his sons were priests. They all had permission to come in the presence of the Lord. And these two offered profane fire, which you just accurately described it. And when they go in and treat what is sacred as common, they're struck dead. And God makes this universal and eternal decree before Moses, or excuse me, through Moses. Moses looks at Aaron. And he says, by those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. And before all the people, I must be glorified. And before I talk about Jim, let me, let me take you back when I really, really learned this. Back in 1996, I was asked to speak for the first time in the nation of Brazil. And it was a national conference. It was a, an arena. And I fly down there. I'm so excited being just first time to Brazil. Yeah, I'll bet. And now we've been down there many, many times, and they actually call Lisa and I Uncle John and Aunt Lisa. I just had a text from one Brazilian just like two hours ago, okay? So I go down there, so excited. I pray all day in the room. I go into the meeting that night, and the arena is packed. And I could hear the praise coming from the outside of the arena, 
because there was like a gap between the roof and the upper wall. <clears throat> they just let it the air ventilate through these massive arenas. And because they get such hard rainstorms, they can't have open outdoor. They have, <clears throat> they have a roof and it's like an arena, but it's got a roof on it. I'm coming into the building and I'm so excited, right? But I come into the building, they put me on the platform and there's no presence of God, none. Now, I wanna make sure all the guys understand what we're saying here. The Bible talks about two types of the presence of God. First is his omnipresence. That's where David said, where can I go and flee from your presence? If I go to the highest mountain, you're there. If I make my bed in the lowest valley, you're there. That is the presence of God that never leaves us nor forsakes us. The other presence of God is his manifest presence. The word manifest means to bring from the unseen into the realm of the seen, the unknown into the realm of the known, the unheard into the realm of the heard. It is when God makes himself real to our senses. That is a very real part of Christianity because Jesus makes this statement. He said, I will manifest myself to you in John 14. Mm -hmm. Now, that's the presence I'm talking about. There was no manifest presence of God. And I'm I'm bewildered because I'm looking at an arena that's packed out. I'm looking at the best musicians in the nation. And I'm thinking, God, this is a believer's conference. Where's your presence? And all of a sudden, it's like the Lord opened my eyes. And I saw people just standing there with their arms crossed, looking around. Other people had their hands in their pocket looking down. Other people are fumbling through their purses. Some people walking in and out, getting concessions, you know, like a sporting event. I, I saw people whispering to one another. And I thought, okay, this will calm down. Well, they go through the praise, the worship. And then one of the, the, the leaders of the whole movement gets up and starts making an announcement and then starts reading scripture. And I'm still hearing a little mutter. Wow. And I'm that's, like, that's unnerving as a speaker. Just oh, know anybody who, who's listening, like that's like, like oh. people are talking to each other yeah. while he's reading from the scripture for the offering. And, and 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 I'm still walking people walking in and out. I'm looking at people still looking around like cap. And now at this point, Ken, I'm getting angry. And they introduce me, and I come up to the podium with my interpreter. He's to my left. I'll never forget this. And I put my elbow on the podium, and I just stared at him. Now, I'm the Friday night speaker at the national conference, right? And all I'm doing is just staring at him. When you do this for about 45 seconds, it will get people's attention. (laughs) And so all of a sudden, you know, after about 45 seconds, all the muttering stops. Everybody stops looking around and walking around. And they're looking at me like, what are you doing? And when I realized I had every single person's attention in that auditorium, I didn't, this is, this is the first words I've ever spoken in Brazil. I didn't say, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. This is the first thing I ever said in Brazil. I have two questions. Question number one, you're sitting talking to somebody across the table. And the whole time you're talking to them, they got their arms crossed, looking around at the ceiling. They got their hands in their pocket, looking down the floor, or they're whispering to a person sitting beside them. Will you continue to talk to them? And the people said, no. I said, what if every time you go over to somebody's house and you knock on their door and when they open the door, they go, oh, it's you again. Will you go back to their house? And they said, no. And I said, I have been in this building now over an hour. And I said, I have not sensed one ounce of the presence of God. And I said, the reason is, is because Psalms 89 verse 7 says, God is to be held in reverence by all those who surround him. I said, you will never find God in an atmosphere where he is not held in the utmost of respect. Wow. And I began to preach to them for 40, 75 minutes on the fear of the Lord. Okay, because I got an interpreter. So a 75 minutes message is a, about a 45 minute message, right? Remember that time I said you could speak at Promise Keepers? 25 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I've gotten seven minutes. I've gotten three hours. So I, I've, you know, being in ministry for 35 years, I'm used to it all, right? So I get done because because it is a conference and they didn't give me a time limit. I get done after 75 minutes later. This is exactly what I said. I said, all right. If you say you are a believer, and I knew this was a believer's conference. It was a, a, you know, a nationwide church gathering, right? I said, you say you're a believer. I said, but you lack the fear of God. And I said, you're willing to repent. Stand up. And 75% of that arena stood to their feet. As soon as they stood, Ken, the presence of God hit the whole place. Wow. And people started, I, I could hear people sobbing. So I'm looking inside, and that presence lasted for a little while, and it lifted. I look inside and I say, God, what do I do? 
And the Lord said, lead him in a a prayer of repentance. So I led him in a simple prayer of repentance. Forgive me for my lack of holy fear. You know, da-da-da-da. Another wave of his presence comes in, stronger than the first. Now people are really weeping, right? And it's so refreshing to finally sense the presence of God, right? right? Because it's like pulling teeth when you're in a a meeting and there's no presence of God. And so um, it lifts. And the Holy Spirit whispers to my heart. He said, I'm coming one more time. And I had no idea what was about to happen. And what I'm about to describe, there's no way I can ever do this justice. As a matter of fact, I did, I spoke to 12,000 pastors and leaders in Goiania, Brazil in 2016. 20 years later, the guy opens up my door and says, I was in that meeting in 1996 and my life was forever changed. Okay. So 20 years later, we had emails on this, we had letters on this, but I'm going to try to tell you what happened. Within seconds of him saying, I'm coming one more time, the only way I know to describe this is that you're at the end of a runway at an international airport, and a 757 jet is taking off in front of you. That kind of a violent wind came blowing into that arena. Now, when it began to blow, the only way I know how to describe what was going on in me is I had goosebumps on top of my goosebumps. And I remember this presence comes in. And the people started screaming. Now, I want you to imagine thousands of Latinos screaming, okay? (laughs) That's loud. But yet the wind was louder. And there's goosebumps on my goosebumps, and I'm frozen. And this thought comes through my mind, and I'm not saying, Ken, this would have happened. But the thought comes through my mind, John Bevere, you say one wrong word, you make one wrong move, you're dead. Now, would that have happened? I don't know. But it did happen with Ananias and Sapphira when they made one wrong move in that kind of atmosphere. Because if you look at what happens right after that, and after she dies, it says great fear came upon the whole church. Peter goes out on the streets and the people are laid within his shadow's distance and everybody's healed on the streets of Jerusalem. Mm. So that's the ty- That's the magnitude of the presence of God. I was fully aware. You don't... You, Irreverence is not going to be tolerated because daddy's not in here. The king is in here. Mm. See, if you look at Esther, Esther's husband is the king of Persia. Now, I'm sure they, they behaved one way in the bedroom because that's my husband, but there was a whole different way that she approached him as king. She had to make sure the scepter was pointed towards her or her head came off. Now, I'm not saying God's cutting our head off. What I'm saying is daddy wasn't in the arena. Believe me, I've had all those times when I'm in the presence of God and daddy says, jump in my lap, son. And I just sense him holding me, right? Mm -hmm. But that night, the king was there. And I remember this win lasted for 90 seconds. And it gradually, in in my mind, I'm, I'm thinking... Could it be a jet aircraft above the building? But I know my heart is, okay. The wind subsides and it leaves in its wake people collapsed all over the auditorium and weeping. And I'm standing there and I'm going, God, what do I do now? And the Holy Spirit was like, you're finished. (laughs) (laughs) And I I looked at the leader and I said, it's all yours. And they whisked me out of the building, put me in the car. And they also had in the car the national singer. She did the solo that night, right? And her husband. She gets in the car and she literally screams. You know, Brazilians are passionate. Did you hear the wind? Did you hear the wind? And and, and, and Ken, I don't want to be the first to say it. So I said, well, maybe it was a jet aircraft flying above the building. Well, she got mad at me. She was, what are you talking about? I saw fire all around the building. I'm like, whoa. Now, her husband was a much calmer man. (laughs) And he kind of stopped the whole her 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 talking and said sir that was an an airplane i said how do you know he said because there were security guards and policemen all around the outside of the arena and when they heard the wind begin to blow inside the arena they all came running in saying what's going on and he said secondly i was at the soundboard because i had to make sure my wife's levels were right for singing and he said i was watching the decimal meters while the wind was blowing and they were at zero so he said what i'm telling you is not one ounce of the sound of that wind came through our sound system that's crazy i will never forget i looked at the driver and he was like do you want to go eat and i said no take me to my hotel room and i sat on my balcony and all i could do is worship till 1:30 in the morning i was so in awe i kept thinking 
did this really happen? So <clears throat> this is this is this is so important that we as people understand that the fear of the Lord is is very real. And now to get to your story about Jim Baker, what happened was um, God. I'm I, I, I'm going to go back and tell one more story. I, God's starting to teach me about the fear of the Lord in 1993, three years before 1996. I'm still learning in 96, and I'm still learning today. But anyway, um, I go to this church that just had a massive, massive campaign. I mean, like it was the biggest church in the area. An international evangelist had just come, and they went through four weeks of meetings. A lot of people were saved and all of this. So I'm doing the next conference after this, right? Lisa and I and some other speakers. And I just felt to get up and teach on the fear of the Lord, but I'm still growing in it, right? And I teach on it, and the next night, the leader of this conference, who's the pastor of this big church, got up and for 15 minutes corrected what I said the night before. He said, hey, as Christians, we don't have to fear God because God's not given us the spirit of fear. And he said, perfected love casts out fear. So what John Bevere said last night was completely not New Testament. It's Old Testament theology. It doesn't apply to us wow. today. And I'm sitting on the, That's I'm what's sitting wrong with the, on the front right row getting ready to be introduced. And he introduced me. <laughs> and I got to get up now and teach after I've been corrected for 15 minutes on everything I said the night before. And I'll, I'll never forget the next morning, I found a construction site in that city. And I cried out as loud as I could. I said, God, I've hurt your church. I'm so deeply sorry. You know, because this is, this is a well-respected pastor. They just had a four-week campaign in which a lot of people were saved. And I, I, I was just like, weep. I was weeping. I said, God, I've hurt your church. So you believed that guy. Well, I was doubting sense. myself. Yeah. And as I continued to pray, I didn't sense the anger of the Lord. I sensed the pleasure of God. And I'll never forget God. Ken, before that prayer time was over, and I was out there like an hour and a half, I found myself literally crying out. And I'm talking about where my voice is raised so loud, I'm like in a stadium yelling after a touchdown. Were there construction workers at this construction? No, site? no. It was a Saturday morning because <laughs> okay. this was Friday night I spoke. Saturday morning, nobody was there, and nobody was in, the, in, in ear, ear, ear could hear me. And I cried out, God, fill me with the fear of the Lord. And that is when my journey really began. So now, one year later, Jim Baker is in prison. And, you know, he had committed, you know, there's, there's a lot of people listening. They don't know who Jim Baker was. Jim Baker was the best known televangelist in the world at the time. He had committed mail fraud, adultery with Jessica Hahn bef seven years before he was arrested. And he was just um, a televangelist and, uh, evangelist who had gone totally corrupt. And I mean, you could say his name anywhere in the world and people knew him. And he had read the first book I wrote called Victory in the Wilderness in prison. He called his secretary, his secretary called my assistant and asked, is there any way John would come visit Jim? And I said, sure. I mean... And was he in prison in South Carolina? He was in Jessup, Georgia. Oh. So we were living in Orlando at the time. So we drove four hours up, Lisa and I both. And I'll never forget, Jim comes walking from the prison, all the doors open, and he comes out in his prison garb, and he said, he just looks at me and he goes, did you write this book or did a, or did a ghost writer? And I said, no, I wrote every word of this book. I've been in wildernesses, but not near like you've been in. And he goes, we have so much to talk about. And, and before he did that, he grabbed me and hugged me and wouldn't let me go for 90 seconds. And he grabbed my two shoulders. You got to understand, this is a man that I had thought I'll never meet all my life because he was a celebrity. You, you, you understand what I'm saying? Everybody in the world knew this guy. And he goes, we, we got so much to talk about. And he sits down and first thing he says to me is this prison was not God's judgment on my life. It was his mercy. And I went, what? He said, yeah, John, if I kept living the way I was living, I would have ended up in hell forever. God was merciful and had me exposed and brought to this prison because Jesus came into my cell and delivered me the first year. He was in his fourth year of prison. He said, and delivered me. He said, we have a Bible study in here now. I don't lead it because I'm such a controller. I'm not leading it. He said, it's a, it's a former Methodist guy that he leads our church service. And he said, we take every word of Jesus. We break it down, every sentence down to five words, down to three words, down to one word, down up to three words. He said, we have so much time here. That's all we do. <laughs> right, yeah. And he said, there are so many things God's showing me that I read in your book. And I'm like, wow, this is amazing. So then 
when I feel like I can ask him a question, I said, Jim, I need to ask you something. You were the most on fire evangelist I have ever seen in my life. At what point did you fall out of out of love with Jesus? When did it happen? Was it like with Jessica Hahn? Did was it before just before that when you started kind of you know cheating on your wife? When, when, when did it really start happening? And he looks at me and he said, "I didn't." I said, "You didn't what, Jim?" He said, "I didn't fall out of Je- out of love with Jesus." Now I'm looking at him totally shocked. And he said, John, I loved him all the way through it. And he's still seeing that I'm speechless, almost about to get angry at him. Mm. And he said, John, I didn't fear God. And he said, there are millions of Americans just like me. They love Jesus, but they have no fear of God. And you know, he then said, Proverbs 16, 6 says, by the fear of the Lord, one departs from evil. It's not by the love of God we depart from evil. It's through the fear of the Lord. I mean, go read it in your Bible, okay? Cleansing ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God, not in the love of God. That's first, Second Corinthians 7, verse 1. So, you know, first of all, I know we got a lot of guys that are going, wait a minute, wait a minute. I, I've seen some really mean-spirited people say that they, they fear God, and I don't like where this is going. Well, let me comfort you right now. That is is not the fear of the Lord, <laughs> okay? So let's let's just take this thing back to basics before we, we get guys that, that are on this podcast that just kind of flip out or turn us off. What is the fear of the Lord? Well, I think a really good way to introduce it is to look at the fact that Moses, when he brings Israel out of Egypt, the first place he wants to bring them is where? Mount Sinai. Why is that? Because that's where he met God in the burning bush. So think about Moses. Moses lived in the most beautiful house in the world. He had all the money he needed and ever wanted. He could have a national party. He could have a sporting event. He could do anything he wanted. He is the king of the most powerful nation in the world's grandson. But he leaves every bit of it because he has one encounter with God at this bush. Now look at Israel. They live in the slums. They have stripes on their back. They have to work all their life to build somebody else's legacy. Their children are put to death. They come out of Egypt and they're constantly saying, let's go back to Egypt. It was better for us back in Egypt. What's the difference? Moses had one encounter with God in person at that bush. Israel had a chance but blew it. Because if you look at Exodus 19, you will see that God says, this is amazing. And this is something that I find most people don't get. God said to Moses, you tell the whole nation of Israel, there is one reason I delivered them out of Egypt, was to bring them to myself. You know, I ask people all the time, where was God, where was Moses bringing the children of Israel when he brought them out of Egypt? Everybody always says the promise. And I go, no. What did he say to Moses seven times? Thus saith the Lord, let my people go that they might worship me in the desert. Why does he want to bring them to the promised land before first bringing them to the promiser? If you bring them to the promised land before bringing them to the promiser, they'll make the promised land into a place of idolatry. And that's what we do. We introduce Jesus as the promise giver, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you all these benefits, good health, happy life, joy, peace. And so now we make all this into an idol because we care more about that than we do being intimate with Jesus. So Israel is looking forward to a land, and Moses is like, "Uh uh-uh, you need to meet the one I met at this bush. So God says to him, you tell everybody that the whole reason I delivered you out of Egypt was to bring you to myself. He said, because I've called you to be a kingdom of priests. What's a priest? A priest is one who goes to God for somebody else, for himself or somebody else. God was saying to the whole nation, I've made you a holy nation and a kingdom of priests. God was saying to Israel, I want all of you to be able to come to me like Moses comes to me. So Moses comes and tells him, he says, hey, get ready because in two days God's coming, right? So God God comes down the third day and when the people see him, they all scream and run away. Isn't that interesting? Why? Because they found more comfort in the presence of Egypt and the people than they did the presence of God. Whereas Moses found more comfort in the presence of God than the presence of people. So they run away. Now, I can't, can you imagine the devastation in Moses? So Moses looks at him and says in Exodus 20, 20, and this is an exact quote. He says, do not fear. So, he, so Moses is looking at all the people after they ran away from God, and he, say, he said, do not fear because God's come to test you. What's the test? To see if his fear is in you so that you may not sin. Now, it sounds like he's contradicting himself. 
Do not fear because God's come to see if his fear is in you. He's not contradicting himself. He's differentiating between being scared of God and the fear of the Lord. Now, what's the difference? The person who is scared of God has something to hide. What does Adam do as soon as he sins, for, uh, it, it, he hides from the presence of the Lord? What are the, what are the elders of Israel saying? The Lord doesn't see us. They think they're hiding from God because they've reduced God down to their level and they think they can hide from him. Okay? Yeah. All right. But the person who fears God has nothing to hide. That person is terrified of being away from God. So here's our first definition of the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is not to be scared of God because you can't have intimacy with somebody you're scared of. And that's God's number one Number one desire for all of us is to be intimate with us. So the fear of the Lord is not to be scared of God. It's to be terrified of being away from him. That's the number one definition of the fear of the Lord. So the fear of the Lord, what is it? It's when we embrace God's heart. We venerate him, which that's a pretty pretty big word. To venerate means you honor, esteem, respect, adore him above everything and everyone else. So therefore, what is important to him becomes important to us. What is not so important to him is not so important to me. Okay? So now, we love what he loves, and we hate what he hates. Now listen, guys, we don't dislike what he hates. We hate what he hates. You say, God hates? Oh yeah, he hates. Let me, let me, let me give you another story. Back in the late 80s, I was praying an hour and a half every morning, yet when I'd get up and preach, my words were so empty. They weren't, they were, they, they just didn't have power in them. And one day I was kind of complaining in prayer and I said, I don't get it. I pray an hour and a half a day. I spend a lot of time in the word. Why, when I preach, do my words seem almost void of power? And the Holy Spirit spoke to me. He said, because you tolerate sin, not only in your life, but in the lives of others. And I went, what? And then he brought me to Hebrews chapter one, where God the Father inaugurates Jesus on the day he was raised from the dead. And you know what God the Father looks at Jesus and says? Because you have loved righteousness. And the Holy Spirit said, stop. All Christians love righteousness. He said, but that's not all God the Father said to the Son. He said, because you've loved righteousness and hated sin, therefore God, even your God, has anointed you above your companions. And the Holy Spirit said to me that day, he said, you learn to hate sin the way I hate sin, and you'll see the anointing of God increase upon your life. Well, let's get back to what I said right from the beginning. Have you ever heard really religious, pharisaical people say, well, I fear God. That's why I hate those sinners over there. You do not fear God because you hate what he loves. See, God loves those people. God in the flesh, manifest in the flesh, died for those people. He died for them. God loves them. He hates the sin that undoes them. So that's the separating thing. The person who really fears God hates sin, but he doesn't hate the sinner. He loves the sinner because he loves what God loves. So I know I've dominated this podcast. I'm so sorry, but you just got me going here. Okay, You're, you're Italian, man. You wind you up and then you just stand back and let you go. I want to ask you about a couple of questions. We got a couple minutes okay. before we're going to hit a break. All right. But I want guys to really take notice of the things that you said. So you talked about... I think that your message on fear of the Lord stands on its own. What I want to do is pull it back a little bit from this unbelievable moment in Brazil. You're seeing the supernatural manifestation, and yet you doubted yourself. Yeah. I mean, you've talked... My head. You, you, but you've said a lot about you've had these amazing moments, but you doubted yourself. And I think that hopefully that's helpful to people listening to this, because even at the top... Because, you know, we read the Bible, and you know they're, they were either chiseling into a rock or writing on papyrus. They don't have room for a lot of detail. So you just sort of get the basic facts. But I often you know, read scripture sometime and go into the book of Acts, for instance, and just put yourself in Paul's shoes for a minute. You know, he's this is new to him. He's all of a sudden they're pulling him and these riots are happening and they're talking about Diana and they're gonna beat him. And he's a real person. And we we tend to put people on these on these pedestals. And we're doing that in the church today. So we see John Bevere, best selling author, huge teacher. I'm a brother in Christ. <laughs> who, go doubt, ahead. who doubts himself. Who, who, who wonders, did, did I really just see that? I think that's helpful for guys to go, I've it's okay. I've never heard or seen anything like that before. So my head's going, certainly this didn't happen. But in my heart the whole time, and that's where you see the difference between your head and your heart. I knew it was God. I just didn't want to be the first one to say it. But yes, to answer your question, oh, I can't tell you how many times I've doubted myself. 
You know, I mean, my, sometimes I've told my staff to do things knowing in my heart I heard from God, but my knees are shaking so bad because in my head I know, are you crazy telling the team to do this right now? And it's a very real, it's a very real, um, uh, what, what's the word? I'm, uh, scenario. Um, our, our souls are not redeemed. You know, the Bible says that our souls are being saved as we continue in the grafted word. So the saving of your spirit is the moment you're born again. The saving of your soul is a process. The saving of our body is an instantaneous thing that will happen Continue at the work resurrection. Out your salvation and fear and fear trembling. Fear and trembling. Philippians 2, 12. Yeah, so yeah, have I doubted? Oh my gosh, yes. In my head. But if I look and I get quiet, I realize in my heart, this is this is right. Today's episode is brought to you through the generosity of Waterstone. For nearly 40 years, Waterstone has assisted givers in supporting their favorite charities, like Promise Keepers, by crafting customized, innovative giving solutions. Waterstone gift strategists stand ready to create your personalized charitable plan. Utilizing business interest, real estate, appreciated assets, charitable trusts, giving funds, and more. These donor-specific giving strategies allow givers to bypass capital gains taxes, receive a fair market value charitable deduction, and have tax-free growth for years to come. Prioritize income, minimize taxes, and optimize your giving with Waterstone. Find out how to give and receive the most from your assets by visiting www.waterstone.org. Promise Keepers is back, and we're relaunching the stadium events that brought millions of men to Christ. Join us this July at AT AT&T Stadium in Dallas, Texas, for a men's conference like no other. Strengthen your soul with unforgettable worship led by top Christian artists. Form friendships with brothers in Christ that last a lifetime, and discover new tools and strategies that will empower you to follow Jesus more faithfully. Be sure to get your tickets before they sell out or find a simulcast location near you. Visit www.promisekeepersevent.com for the latest information. We'll see you this summer. Okay, so we're just coming back from break, and and I'm thinking about a lot of the stuff you were talking about. And you were talking about hating sin and fearing the Lord. Yes. And yet I also know that you're really good friends with a lot of pastors who don't seem to talk much about sin or repentance. Like, and let's just take a Joel Osteen, for instance. Mm-hmm. You're good friends with him. You like him. You respect him. I've spoken for Joel once, and I spent the afternoon at his house, Lisa and I, with he and Victoria. I absolutely love that man. I love him deeply. Everybody I know who knows him loves him. And can I tell you, I saw, and this was years ago, this was about five years ago, I saw a man who feared God. Now, let me bring understanding to this. Um, I can tell a person who fears God by the way they speak within a few minutes, by the way they live, because the fear of the Lord is to depart from evil. So the person who lives a very godly, holy life is a person who fears God. So let's look at 2 Corinthians 6 and 7. If you look at right in between those two, it says God gives us a promise that he would walk in, in and among us, right? Therefore, having this this promise, Paul said, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So we've been, Lisa and I have been with Joel Olstein in a hotel at a vacation spot because Lisa and I were getting a break and they were getting a break. We didn't plan it together, but we were there with them and we spent time with them. And then I was at his house. And both times I saw a man who walked in real, authentic holiness. Mm. Now, back to my explanation. I look at pastors as almost like GPs, general practitioners. A pastor can teach on anything and do it well, just as a general practitioner can look at a human body and cover any area. I mean, when, when I broke my leg skiing when I was in second grade, my GP is the one who put the cast on me. It wasn't an orthopedic, right. okay? GPs can do it all. That to me would, would be like a pastor. But then you have specialists. So if, if, if somebody's going through something with their throat, you don't get sent to an orthopedic. You get sent to the nose, ears, eyes, throat specialist, right? Okay. 
God has this in the body of Christ. He has people out there that he has given them a message. They have a thousand sermons, but they carry one message. I have been told, I have been introduced to conferences several times where the leaders of the conference would say, and this is back when I was younger, I was, you know, in my 40s. The leader was, let's say, in his late 50s, and he's introducing me to thousands of people. And he said, you know, every time John Bevere comes to this conference, he may preach on offenses, he may preach on breaking intimidation, he may preach on honor, but the underlying message is always the fear of the Lord. Because I really believe God showed me right from the beginning, this is the message I'm having you carry to my body. I look at Joel Olstein, and Joel Olstein has been given a message of hope. And that is why he has stayed focused on that message. Now, are people to repent before, in order to get saved? Absolutely. The Bible makes it clear. That is the number one foundation of the church. Second foundation is faith in God. Then we work our way up from there, Hebrews chapter 6. So, I'm not going to address what Joel pre- uh, preaches on this podcast because there's not time for it. But I do recognize that he, in his specialty, is a man who's called to lead a lot of souls to Jesus and bring hope. That's my perception. It's two cents. And we got 98 more cents there that I'm going to let Jesus take care of. But I have a whole lot of respect and love for Joel because I watch the way he loves his wife and children. I watch the way he walks the walk. And I'll be honest with you, Ken, I'm, I'm almost 62 years old. I've seen them all. You got to realize I've been invited to major conferences and churches all over the world, and I've been in ministry 35 years. And what really draws my heart to a minister more than anything else is how does he treat his wife? How does he treat his children? That is the most important thing I look for. And I'm going to tell you something. I look at that with Joel, and I think, wow, I love the way he loves Victoria and his children. How do you feel when you see, uh, I mean, we don't want to make this all about Joel, but just one follow-up. You know, you see Babylon B come out with um, some really disparaging f- jokes at his expense. And I've had people send me some of those uh, about Osteen. And I, I don't know Joel, but I just feel in my spirit just just bummed for him. Like, I just, I feel like I need to defend him even though I don't know him. Because everybody I know who knows him says what a great godly man he is. Does it? You do know him. When you see that stuff, does it just kind of... It hurts my heart, but... It's an indication of the lack of the fear of the Lord. Now, the reason the fear of the Lord lacks in our society is two reasons. Number one, we remove God from from schools, from our institutions, through prayer and the Word of God. Do you know in 1860, I believe it was, the Supreme Court ruled unanimously that if a high school didn't teach the Bible, they would not get government funding. Yeah, I, now, told, I told you that. I, yeah. did. Okay. I did tell you that. Okay. Uh, but, I was like, I don't understand. I've been asking Shaka for this. The Supreme Court said public schools had to teach the Bible. Yeah. So what, what did we just ignore that? Where, where did that go? I, I, I know. And, and that's another whole... To hear the godless say but, the but, Supreme but, Court has ruled, so it's, to, it's off the table, right? To affirm, uh, Dennis Burke is the one I heard it from. Oh. Okay. Um, the guy that teaches... Or David Benton, or the guy that teaches American history. I heard it from him. And you, so it's not it's not a it's not a rumor. Is what I'm saying is I, I I've heard it from others. So okay, what's the second reason that our society lacks the fear of the Lord? See, if you look at King Abimadad, he had a fear of God in him. That's why when God came to him in a dream and said, "You're a dead man," he said, "God, I." I thought he was a god. He, he, she was an available woman. I, I would never have done it. And God said, "You're talking about the guy who took Sarah, yeah, and yeah. Abraham says, yeah. my sister." And God said, "That's why I protected you and kept you from having sex with her, because of his fear of God." Hmm. Cornelius fears God. That's why an angel comes to Peter and says, "Go tell that guy about Jesus." Okay, so if you look at what Paul says, this message of salvation is to what? is to all the Jews and all who fear God. Okay, so the first, you said there were two. Okay, what was so the first one again? First one is, we remove God from our society. Okay. But the second one is, the church hasn't walked in the fear of the Lord. Amen. So, the Gentiles mock us. You, you know, you see this all through, you know, because we don't do it well. We don't live our Christianity. So now, when you see a man who speaks out against 
an anointed servant like that and makes mockery and fun of him. It's a lack of the fear of the Lord. Now, there have been many, many, many pastors that have been lied to, even about offerings, and the people haven't fallen over dead. Right. Why does Ananias and Sapphira fall over dead? Think about it. Why do they fall over dead? I mean, let, let, let's think of the Old Testament. You got Hophni and Phinehas who are committing adultery with women who gather at the door of the tabernacle. 30 feet from the presence of God, they're having sex with these women. It's unbelievable. Okay? Why women, aren't they, women but who wait, come whoa, to whoa, worship. Whoa, whoa, wait, wait. But why aren't they struck dead? But then you go a couple generations later, and Uzzah just steadies the ark, and he's dead. Okay, what? There's got to be an explanation. There is. The greater the manifested glory of God, the swifter the judgment of God. You will see a pattern throughout the whole Bible. Order, glory, judgment. Divine order always has to come. God says to Moses, make the tabernacle exactly according to the pattern of heaven. They make it exactly, and what happens? The glory of God comes in, so much so nobody can even go in because of the glory of God. A few chapters later, Nadab and Abihu come in with irreverent fire, dead. Now, in the days of Hophni and Phinehas, the Bible says the lamp of God was almost out. The glory has practically left. That's why they're committing adultery and nothing's happening to them. But now David is trying to restore the glory of God, and now Uzzah steadies the ark and is dead. So Solomon puts the temple together. He does everything according to the law of Moses. And what does the Bible say? The glory of the Lord filled the temple, right? And then you look at the children of Israel, how they profane the temple and judgment comes with Babylon. Now come to the New Testament. John the Baptist comes to set things in order in people's hearts because the new temple is no longer a building. It's the heart of a born-again believer. It starts with John. That's why Jesus said the law and prophets prophesied until John. Then Jesus comes and says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, right? No man comes to the Father except through me. People now get born again through Jesus, right? So now here comes the glory on the day of Pentecost. Boom! It gets the attention of the whole city. There's fire. Fire. I don't believe there were little tongues on top of these guys' heads. I believe they were engulfed in fire. Okay? So now five chapters later, somebody comes in with their reverence. Order, glory, judgment. And Ananias and Sapphira are knocked over dead. They're... They're bringing their offering. These are church believers. So what's going to happen now in these last days? Once again, God's putting the church back into order. Why? Because the glory of the latter temple is going to be greater than the former. What we're about to walk into is going to be greater than the book of Acts. God spoke to me one day and said, what you're about to see in your lifetime will make the book of Acts look like child's play. Why? Because the glory of the latter house is greater than the former. Because God gave his... The former reign moderately, Joel said. In other words, the latter reign of God's Spirit, pouring out his, his greatness, his glory, is going to make the book of Acts look like child's play. It's going to make it look moderate. Okay? Think about it. They pray and buildings shake. Peter's walking down the streets and people are getting appealed. I mean, that's like walking through a hospital and everybody and emptying the hospital. I mean, it's it's amazing what God is about to do. So, so what's happening here? He's putting order back. That's why he's got guys like you. He's got all these great, really prophetic voices in the body of Christ right now that are calling people back to the heart of God. They're calling people to genuine repentance, not religious repentance, genuine repentance. Get rid of your idols and, and return to the Lord. That's a prophet's voice, right? And, and there are guys that are listening to us right now. They're one of those prophets. I mean, with Jesus, his first coming, it was one man, John the Baptist. With the second coming, it's an Elijah anointing, but it's sons and daughters, men servants and maid servants. It's a company of prophets. Some are going to be pastors. Some are going to be business people. Some are going to be ER nurses, but they're going to have a voice of return to the Lord. They're not going to be messing around like John the Baptist wasn't messing around, okay? They're going to call for order. Then God's glory is going to manifest in the most profound way. And then the multitudes that are in the valley of decision are going to come into the kingdom. However, we are going to see more incidences like Ananias and Sapphira once that greatness is poured out again. And I believe that Acts gave us a warning that, yes, there is a glory coming, and you better have the fear of the Lord in your heart to be ready for this coming move. 
Wow. I mean, one of the things I've wondered about is why is it when I'm in third world countries preaching, I see miracles. I see demons manifesting in a way that I've never seen. I've seen a woman levitate, and and me and a bunch of other guys couldn't push her to the ground. I know. I've seen and yet, you don't see it in America. And I've I'm always seen that, been like, but I've what? seen similar. Yeah. Why? 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 And you just answered it. You just because I have felt the presence of the Lord in places like Manila or the back backwoods of Mexico or Haiti that I've never seen in the United States. And you just really helped to make a lot come clear for me. And We're a little bit behind in spiritual things in the United States. As two guys that have traveled all over the world, we know that. We know that the United States is more of a Laodicean church. We're not, we're not hot. We're not cold. We're, we're at the place where we could be vomited out of Jesus' mouth. I'm not saying that to be harsh, ru- mean, cruel, judgmental. And, and anybody that ever says that should say it with a total fear and trembling and heartbreaking for the nation. This is why I'm praying for our nation more than any nation in the world, because I do see that's a very real message. I mean, think about it. You can't vomit. You cannot vomit out of your body what's not in your body. Jesus is talking to a church, not an assumed church. He said, you're not hot. You're not cold. Why? Because you say you're rich. You're not rich. You're wretched, miserable, and poor, naked, and blind. He said, I'm about to vomit you out of my body. I, 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 there's no other way of explaining that. He wouldn't have said, vomit you out of my body. He would have said, I'm about to just put you away if we were only close. You cannot vomit except that which is in your body. That's the only thing that can be vomited. So, yes, it's, it's, it's a wake-up call. And, and this is why I... I, 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 you know, I was doing a Bethel tour a couple of years ago, and, and we were doing a Killing Kryptonite. They would do an hour of worship. I would preach an hour on Killing Kryptonite, which is the book that I have on repentance, right? And I'm in one of the biggest churches in the city, and the pastor's, the pastor's plaque right in front of his desk that he looked at all week long and every Sunday morning that he told me about. He was actually, as he said, my number one responsibility is to inspire these people, and I thought. Huh, Paul, like the last letter he writes on earth, the last chapter, says to a young pastor of 40,000 people in Ephesus, preach the word. This is your responsibility. Whether it's welcomed or unwelcomed, he said, you as a man of God are to show people in what way their lives are wrong. Paul didn't say to Timothy, inspire people. He said, preach the word, whether it's welcome or unwelcome. If it's unwelcome, I'm not inspiring. But John, inspiring people makes for big churches and big salaries and private jets. But if and... that's our goal, we'll end up in the wrong destination. Man, preach that. So this is why I love, I deeply love, I'm not critical of the American church. I love this church. I've given most of my time to the American church and will continue to do so because I love this American church so much. But we're, we're in a we're not in a great place. We're not in the place we, you, you know, you think about Jesus. You think you are. You think you are. You think you are. But really, you're wretched, poor, miserable, blind, and naked. You think you're rich. You think, right? In American church, we think, oh my gosh, we got over 30,000 people in our church. Okay, what kind of people are in our church? Are, are these people that are committing adultery on their wives? Are these people that are cheating in business? Are these people that are walking a, a life of godliness? Are these people that will fall over dead like Ananias and Sapphira once the glory comes? I, I know this. Moses and Joshua were the minority on top of the mountain. Aaron and the people were the majority. Mm. And when they created that calf, they called it Yahweh. They didn't call it Baal or Ra. They called it Yahweh. And Aaron himself said, behold, tomorrow is a feast of Yahweh, pointing right at that calf. So they created a Yahweh, God, in the image of what would give them what they wanted. Have we created a Jesus? We say he's raised from the dead. Because they said, hey, Yahweh delivered us from Egypt. Have we said Jesus has delivered me from my sin? He's died on the cross for me. But have we created a Jesus in our own image that will give us what we want? Preach that, man. I often say... We don't worship Jesus. We worship an idol called Jesus. And I got a uh, girl, read your Bible. I just want to make sure everyone sees this. This is <laughs> it's my wife's. We are in uh, Lisa's in my home right now, our podcast room. It's, I told Ken, it's so weird to be in my own house being a guest. <laughs> <laughs> You've never gotten to talk so much in this room. Mm-mm. 
Because Lisa and I do podcasts, and uh, we're, we're two two eight personalities, so we're always going at it. Two Italians. She's Sicilian. I'm Italian. So let me ask you. So you're talking about Revelation one through three when you talk about Laodicea. Yes. Jesus comes to uh, to John. John's on Patmos. John, who walked with Jesus, one of his top disciples. Um, John, who makes just sure that we understand that he's loved by Jesus, right? He makes sure that we understand that he outran Peter to the tomb. John's a pretty competitive guy, yeah. right? Yeah. When he turns around and sees Jesus as he is today in his manifest presence, he faints as one dead. Yeah. And then Jesus says, hey, John, get up, and I got some things to say. And he's talking to churches. And clearly, he's not just talking to churches in that day, but he's talking to churches of all time because he says to Philadelphia, some of you are not going to die. You're just going to get taken straight to heaven. So obviously he wasn't talking to people 2,000 years ago. He's talking to people hopefully today. Yeah. So for the Church of Philadelphia, one of the two churches Jesus has nothing critical to say, Yes. is there a possibility that that church is also a church of today? That, yes. Of revival? That church is in the United States, and it's in other nations of the world. I believe all seven of those churches are in that Bible because if they were only meant for the historical churches— then they never would have been put in the Bible. The fact that they're in the Bible means they have prophetic application, which means they apply to us today. Now, also, and I do believe this, many many eschatologists believe that those churches represent the different ages of the church throughout the 2,000-year church age. But I think both are true. I think all seven of those churches are in in the earth today. I think all seven are represented. And the question all of us have to ask ourselves is, do we want to be a part of the Laodicean church or the Philadelphia church? Now, that choice is ours. And when I say the American church, I'm saying a good segment of the American church. I believe there is a great segment of the American church that is like that Philadelphia church. And I believe they're very godly. And this is why I do not believe our nation will go down down the tubes like some people think and, and, and preach. I, 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 I believe if you've, I believe there are millions of God-fearing, holy, praying believers in this nation. And when you have that many God-fearing, holy believers praying, God is going to listen. And, and, and I, 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 do, I believe our forefathers made a covenant for this nation, that it would be an, it's the only nation that has ever chosen God. God chose Israel. Now, believe me, Jesus said, you didn't choose me, I chose you. So God ultimately did choose America. But what I'm saying is our leaders said, we, were we formed around choose God. Right, to be one nation under God. Well, there are not just a few politicians and people and big tech companies and mainstream media people who can say, we're going to take this nation away from God because there's too many God-fearing believers in this nation that are standing firm on what our forefathers said, and that is this nation will go through a move of God that will bring so many people to Jesus, and this nation will not be given over to evil. We won't let it as long as we're here. Now, maybe after he catches his bride away, which is not going to be everybody that attends a church, we all know that, maybe something will happen. But I'm telling you, as long as there are people like you, as long as there are people like guys that really love God that are listening to this podcast, I don't believe this nation's going down. Here's my thought. I think exactly what you just said, and the people are desperately looking for leaders to follow, people to say, we're going that way. And right now, the people are waiting for someone to show up or some people to show up and say... This is where we're going. I see so much of a, just a pent up demand in people. Like when I start to speak, they're just like, please, like, let's go, you know? And so I agree with you wholeheartedly. There's so many godly people in this country, but there's confusion because a lot of pastors are teaching garbage. There's, you know, we were just talking before we turned on the microphones about pastors not preaching against abortion. It's unbelievable that they could sit there and see babies being dismembered in the womb and say nothing about it and say they're doing what God wants. It's, it's outrageous. So people are confused about what to think and how to think it. That's a tragedy because what we've done is elevated the priorities of having a lot of people in our movements over truth. Yes. And so, um, you know, I, I, I am the first to say, I mean, after being in the church now well, over 40 years, we were really dysfunctional in the early years. In the 80s and 90s, we were so dysfunctional. <laughs> And we had no community. And then the church started realizing that community is a huge part of the church. And if you look at Acts 2, it is. They continue in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayers. 50% of that is community. However, what we've done today is we've elevated community above truth. And once you elevate community above truth, 
now you're in trouble because you can build, they built a community at the foot of the mountain once Moses was gone. <laughs> okay. So here's what I really believe. I believe that there are people like Moses, they're on the top of the mountain in the presence of God. And God is downloading things into them right now. And I believe these people, God's going to touch them and they're going to come down like Moses came down and they're going to have the authority of heaven on them. And so Ken, I believe you're, you're one of those, and I'm not saying this to flatter you. I believe you're one of those men. I believe there are guys listening to us. They're, they're one of those men. But let me tell you something. Moses didn't come forth prematurely. He was on the backside of the desert for 40 years. Mm -hmm. He tried to do it in his own strength when he was 40, but it wasn't until he was 80 when God said, your time has come. And there is something that I've realized down through the years that only God, only God can touch a person and say, it's time for you. And I've seen so many people try to promote themselves. And I'm, I'll never forget, I was, I, was, I was the chief master striver. I was flying back from the Philippines trying to birth my own ministry. And I read in the Gospel of John, I read these words, there was a man sent by God whose name was John. And the Holy Spirit said to me, do you want to be sent by God or do you want to be sent by John Bevere? I said, I want to be sent by God. He said, good. He said, if you go, you go in your authority. If I send you, you go in my authority. And <clears throat> I, I will say that, you know, today you can, through modern technology, you can get a blog, you can get an Instagram account, you, know, you, can, you can get a podcast, you can promote yourself. But I'm looking for that touch that comes from heaven because I know that for something to be done that's going to last eternity, it can only be done with his help. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. And to be honest with you, Ken, I'm not interested in doing anything unless it is spirit-breathed and spirit-led. I don't want to birth anything in the flesh. Otherwise, I got to provide for it in the flesh, and I'm not interested in that. And that's the way these men are that are listening to us, a lot of them. And so I'd say to all you guys, there's an appointed day coming. A lot of you know that there's calls on your life, and you're on the mountain with God. Hey, don't promote yourself. Believe me, if there is a calling and God is sending you to people, he will send you at the appointed time. Let me ask you a question. Um, of all the books you've written, and yes. I've read several and they're excellent, all of them. But from what we're talking about today, people are listening to this go, I really want to delve deeper into that. Which book of yours should they read? My favorite book, which actually convicted me more than any book I've written, is called Driven by Eternity. Yeah, that's one of my favorites of yours. Lisa and I made a decision, and our team made a decision um, just just a few months ago. <laughs> we developed an app. It's over a $2 million app. It's all paid for. Businessmen and women gave to it. It's got 111 languages on, on it. And we were going we to actually say to the English-speaking people, you have to give an offering to come on this app. And we were in a meeting, and I said, guys, if you walk into a church and an usher's holding an offering bucket, are you going in? And I said, if somebody's sitting in a church for six months and they haven't given an offering, you're going to say you can't come back anymore? I said, guys, I'd rather Jesus say, why did you sink this ministry giving everything away? Then why did you hold back my word from people? Amen. So we developed this multi-million dollar app with all the translations on it and everything. It's over a $10 million app. It's called Messenger X. You can get it at the App Store. You, if you've got an Android, you can go to Google Play. I've got four. I've got it, by the way. <laughs> Addison, made sure I downloaded it. <laughs> I've got four books on there. That's I've got, I think, uh, Relentless, the Holy Spirit book, which is really one of the best-selling books right now. Story of Marriage is on there. Then I've got eight audio books. So right now, your guys can go on there and start listening to eight books or reading eight books. Is it you reading it? Yeah, it's me reading it, and I don't read. I preach it. That's not hard to do, though. No, I preach it. I, I, oh. I, I remember the first one I did was Beta Satan, and I was stumbling all over the place. And all of a sudden, the thought came to me, why are you reading this? Preach it. And I start preaching, and my hands are going. I was in focus on the family. <laughs> I'm all over like this. The editor's sitting there smiling, right? But it came out good. And and people have told me when they listen to our audiobooks. And we, I've got eight of those audiobooks on that app. Wow. And, and people don't have to pay for it. That's and, amazing. And, and it's amazing because Oasis Audio, who did all these books, and they paid for all of this, who have the rights, when they heard we were giving all of our 35 courses plus away, they said, we want to do the same thing. So on this app, you've got 35 plus courses. You've got the Breaking Intimidation course. You've got the Driven by Eternity course. You've got all these courses, right? Beta Satan course. But then you've got all of Oasis audiobooks that I read, eight of them, on there. 
and there's no charge. And you're saying, by the way, you're saying bait of Satan. The bait of Satan. That's is, the book that sold Lisa almost come up with that name? Did, No, actually, it was a guy named John Mason. He was the publisher uh, at the time. That's a great name. Oh, I yeah, to this day, I am so grateful. Every time I see John, I'm like, John, thank you so much for that title. Because I was so frustrated. I kept saying, it's about a fence, but there's no good title with a fence in it. <laughs> okay, so give us where we can get that one more time and then pray us out. Just go to your app store on your iPhone and type in Messenger X. Don't put a, a space between the R and the X. Or if you're on an Android, go to Google Play, type in Messenger X. Or if you're on your computer, you can go to messengerx.com and you'll get on. All it does is says, uh, give us your email uh, address. You get a link. We want to make sure you're not a robot. You click it, put your right in. You're in, you're ready to go. You just tell them what you like, what your name is, and you're in. And so for so many guys who don't read, they can hear you preaching um, Driven by Eternity at them while they're driving down the road. <laughs> we also have our Hollywood Affabel that was done by John Reese davies and several other, other well-known actors on there. So one of Disney's Top scorers scored it. That's all on there. I mean, one guy bought 5,400 of them at $20 a pop, you know, Jeez. 10 years ago. Now it's on there for no charge. So there's he, well, so he much. Off. Oh, no, he <laughs> loves he loves God so much he couldn't care less. We just had, we made a decision. We just said, we're, we, you know, Jesus's final words was to make disciples of all nations. And we thought, we just have to do this. And so that's why we did. So pray us out, would you? Absolutely. Hey, guys, listen to me before I pray. You know, if you look at Isaiah 11, the Holy Spirit of fear is one of the seven manifestations of the, of the Holy Spirit, the fear of the Lord. And it's the manifestation that Jesus delighted in. So Jesus said, if you ask your Father for the Holy Spirit, he'd give them to you. But before we can pray for you to receive the Spirit of the fear of the Lord, the Holy Spirit of the fear of the Lord, the first thing we got to do is make sure you love Jesus and that you have a relationship with him. So if you don't, and you'd say, wow. I've really heard the gospel from Ken and John today. I just want you to pray this out loud. Just say, God in heaven, please forgive me for living life my way, apart from you, my creator. But today that's changing. This day I give my spirit, soul, and body, everything I am and everything I have, to you, Jesus. You are now my Lord and my King. And now, Father, the first thing I ask for is that you would baptize me in your Holy Spirit of the fear of the Lord. Fill me to overflowing because I'm crying out to you right now to receive the spirit of the fear of the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Awesome. That was good stuff, man. It was great being on with you. It's it's an honor. Thanks for listening to On the Edge podcast with Ken Harrison. For a lot of you, this is our first time meeting and I want to tell the men listening about an organization I'm the current chairman of, Promise Keepers. Promise Keepers is an organization founded by Coach Bill McCartney that's led men across the world to a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. Promise Keepers is calling men back to courageous and bold servant leadership. To learn more and get involved in the mission of Promise Keepers, visit promisekeepers.org. Follow on social media or download the Promise Keepers app on Apple Store or Google Play by searching Promise Keepers. Through the Promise Keepers app, you receive access to devotionals, Bible studies, and other great articles and video content, and a community to build friendships, lead your family, and become transformative leaders. See you next time for On the Edge with Ken Harrison.